often there's a lot of theology added to God's understanding or our, I should say, man's understanding of who God is. A lot of people today will often use some pre-programmed idea that you know, we're so much smarter now than God was when he walked around the earth that we need to give the four spiritual laws or we need to do the Roman road or we need to somehow tell people about Jesus in such a way that they'll confess their sins, they'll admit that they're a sinner, they'll see that they have a need and that they'll cry upon, call upon the name of the Lord to be saved and that they'll commit their lives and become, you know, born again Christians and they'll no longer be born in the flesh but of the spirit. They'll also get baptized, you know, within the week. They'll also go out and become, you know, give Jesus their life so that he'll be Lord of their life so that he'll sit on the seat of their throne and that they'll come into their heart and, you know, we throw all this junk out of our trunk, pulling out all of our old ideas, you know, and throwing them at people and saying, now, are you ready to ask God into your life? Uh, excuse me? That's really not the gospel. I mean, I don't know how many times I've tried to say to people, look, it sounds confusing, but if you want to go forward at some altar call to straighten your life out, go ahead. If you feel good about it, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. Because you see, it's not about these formulas and fancy plans and stands and everything else that Christians are trying to save you, make you, break you, or somehow put into you per, your perspective some way of doing something that they did, and they didn't know what they were doing either at the time that they did it. But the bottom line is you just call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. That's what Jesus said. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. That's all, pure and simple. God knows your heart. He knows where you're at. He knows what's going on. You know, if you're someone who really wants to be saved, you're saved, or you will be. All you got to do is call out. Just say, God, save me. And from that moment on, God will honor your request. I mean, you really have to make it a genuine request in some way. And no, you don't have to do that by it, confessing Jesus before man. And, you know, there's a lot of guilt trips that people lay on each other. You know, if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before the Father. You know, down the road, you know, you might want to do something like that, maybe. You know, you go to a church, you know, kind of get all the shtick, you know, and get it down and get this science of theology in your mind so you can do it their way, and you'll feel better. But really, a lot of it has to do not with what's coming out of, you know, some kind of great evangelistic crusades that have gone on in America for centuries, but rather what Jesus said. Read the words in red. What did Jesus say? You know, if you read what Jesus says and he says, come follow me, and you say, I'll follow you. Bingo, there you are. You're a follower. If Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, and bingo, you're a disciple. Follow him. Do it. Do what he tells you to do. Because a lot of this gospel confusion about cheap grace and expensive grace and atonement and sanctification and ramifications and denial and whether they're real Christians, pew sitters or pew poopers or whatever they come up with, you know, nowadays to say, are you a true Christian? Did you really get saved? Have you been fully immersed, partially immersed, sprinkled, dabbed, dunked, chunked, or whatever? I mean, no offense, but even I think, and I'm a Christian for 35 years, that a lot of what Christians do, it's really a hunk of junk. <laughs> I mean, it's a bunch of malarkey, you know? I mean, I have enough of my Jewish heritage in me to look at the Gentiles and go, <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, as long as I'm with you, I'll do it that way. But when I'm over here, I'm doing it that way. <laughs> and when I'm over there, I'm doing it that way. Because you know what? The way that God cares is right here. God cares what's in here and comes out here. If in here you ask him to take over your life or to help you in your life or to, you know, save you from yourself, much less from the world and its ways, you know, then God's going to. I mean, what do you think God is? Impotent? Let's be real. Or if you ask Jesus into your life, then if you ask Jesus to cause you to become born again, guess what? You'll be born again. But you see, Jesus even said it himself. He says, look, I come to do the will of my Father. So, you know, you call upon the name of the Lord, you know, and ask God into your life, and you know, God's going to start working on you. He'll start leading you into place. Now, when that actually occurs, hey, you know, that's between God and you. You know I mean? You could make it 
your salvation date that you ran forward in 1922, you know, and you did it right through, you know, and you were true. Or you could just, you know, trust the Lord that, hey, I know myself that, yes, in, oh, about 1974, you know, I went to a Jesus concert, you know, I had this miraculous emotional experience. But I also know after having been saved for a while, when I look back on those years prior to 1974, I know God was working on me way before 1974. Man, I, I was watching a Jesus People concert that I didn't even know was a Jesus People concert over at a friend of mine's house. And I seem to remember, you know, seeing Keith Green and I kind of look at the years that that was a concert and I was like, oh, wow, that was before I was saved. And I thought it was pretty cool. So don't be surprised if your theology or your idea of how God does things isn't really the way God does things. There's a certain amount of truth to some of the scriptures, but you see, what Jesus said was, search the scriptures from cover to cover in the volume of the book it's written of him. If you look in the volume of the book, you'll see that there are people that have been chosen from birth, that eventually, you know, they figured out that God had saved them from even before their childhood because their parents were praying for them. Or that some point in time, you know, somebody was doing something and God decided to use that person so then God saved them and used them for that purpose. You know, there's a lot more to what you don't know than what you think you know or what you do know. And that's the point of the gospel is that it's really just simply good news to help you get out of where you're at. Because if you're screwed up in life, you know, and you really don't know what you're doing, welcome to the club. Most people don't. That's why you become a Christian, to find out what a Christian lifestyle is like, what a God-directed lifestyle is like, what a godly life is like. That's what the word Christ-like means, to be like Jesus, the way he lived his life, to be likened unto him. Because, you see, Jesus' life, the way he lived it, was so pleasing to his father that he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now, there's a lot of people that are running around, you know, taking out what Jesus said and ignoring it and taking in what God has said and saying, well, you got to do the Ten Commandments, you know, and you got to live like the Sabbath, you know, and you got to do this on Saturday and do that on Sunday and the rest of the week, Monday, you know, you're going to have to just kind of do this, that, and the other thing. You know, they come up with 613, 714, 522, and, you know, hike. They try to take the ball and run with it, or in this case, the Torah, and try to pretend that you have to enforce or do something that really wasn't meant for you. No offense to you Gentiles, you know. But quite frankly, you're talking to a people that was in slavery that God had to say, look, you guys don't even know enough to not build golden calves. And that's what they were doing until they got the law of Moses and the law written for them. It says, hey, look, I don't want you know, building no golden calves, you know, and worshiping idols. You know, that's just not a good thing in my opinion. You know, so I don't want you doing that. I'd rather you worship me. And, you know, so God says, hey, you know, so I'm going to give you some, some instructions, as we're told they are called, commandments, as we know they're meant to be, and reasons of why those guys couldn't go up the mountain because they were terrified of all their sinful ways that they were not coming to the light, as Jesus said. So you and I, hey, we learn from those things. We say, yeah, well, if God saved them, he could save me. You know, I mean, we look at Jesus, he says, look, come unto me, all who are laid. All who are weary and heavy laden, all those who have burdens, when you can't do it, then you ask God to get you through it. Because you see, you could ignore being saved. You know, you could go on your life and live your life, you know, blah blah blah, and go on your happy, merry way. But a little kind of thing's going to happen. You know, that science has proven. You know, or maybe we'll call it godly science has proven that. Someone rose from the dead and said, hey, you know what? There's more to death than what you think. It's called life. <laughs> Oops. And when you pass from this physical existence, there's still a spiritual existence. Oops. So here's what you got to do. And that's kind of what Jesus' message was. Look, you can talk all you want to about the law and about what you got to do as far as your physical body is concerned. And yeah, there's, you know, God's going to bless you somewhat and there'll be a benefit. But let me tell you about what's going to happen after you die. 
There's a spiritual part of you that you don't realize is either going to heaven or hell. And that's kind of what he was talking about, you know, being born again, not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And so he said, look, the only person can tell you about it is the one who came down from heaven to tell you about it. And he's going back up to heaven in order to explain it, you know, more so in detail once you get there. Because, you know, you're not going to know it all when you get there. As much as you think you know now, you have no clue what's going on in heaven when you finally arrive. Even as John, the beloved, didn't have a clue until he arrived. And even then, when the angels told him, he didn't have a knowledge of what to do. One minute he's on his face, the next minute he's dancing around, he's happy, and then he's sad, and then he's crying, and then he's weeping, and watching this whole thing unfold. And sure enough, he wrote it down so we'd know what was going on. And even now, we still don't act like we know what's going on because people try to interpret it. You know, some idiot comes along and says, well, you know those angels you see in the book of Revelation? They're not really angels, or they're not really demons, they're drones. You know, they're man-made machines, you know, but they didn't know how to explain it in those days. So, never mind that Jesus told John, write these things you see in heaven. Really, they're just machinations, you know, man's made machines and tanks and things coming, you know. Right. Okay. Of course, they always skip the parts that says what they are, only to put the parts of what they want to interpret. And that's kind of how the gospel sometimes gets thrown at you, you know. It'll get thrown at you a billion different ways. Because the truth is, every time somebody throws it at you, you know, in some way, call it the gospel, they really care. I mean, yes, they do. You know, I know it sounds like they're trying to notch up a Bible Belt point, you know, or somehow connive into getting you into the church, but cults really do that. You know, that's they, they want you in their church. No offense, most people who follow Jesus will say, go wherever God leads you to go and get, you know, fed by reading the word, you know, somewhat and understand what you're doing, you know, and if God takes you there, then God takes you there. But if he doesn't, get out of there. Try out some other ones. Those are the ones that you kind of want to listen to because, you no, know, frankly, when somebody's so obsessive that they say, follow me, you might not want to do that. You know, you might want to kind of check out the source, which accordingly, you know, if you think about the word Christian, then the source of Christian must be Christ, you know, and that means Jesus. So you kind of want to go to the source of Christianity, you know, Jesus himself. Stick with that. You know, it's got a little easier to get it from the horse's mouth than it is sometimes to get it from the donkey's mouth. Because a donkey really is a cross between, guess what, a mare and a who. Mule, huh, well, oh well, one's a beast of burden, the law, and one's grace. <laughs> we won't try to figure out which is which, will we? But that's kind of what you get when, you know, Balaam's mule is talking. You know, it's kind of like sometimes you hear a lot of men talking and you can't figure out which is the mule and which is the man. It's the way I look at it. Oh, boy, I'd rather hear what God has to say. And that's why in the gospel, you know, whenever you... you think you got it down of some set routine. Even when I got saved, I thought I had it down, you know, what they were going to do. They didn't do it the way that, quote unquote, you're supposed to do it. <laughs> oh, I kind of got shuffled off to the side and prayed for it. And I was like, wow, boy, were my eyes open. But the point is, God saves. People don't. You think you're making a choice, but God already knows what you're going to do. So really, when it's time, Make it time. Make time for it to find out if God is real. Because that's what you need to do to figure out the gospel. You need to kind of sit down and decide, is all this Christian stuff phony? Is it just like churchy, kind of religious-y stuff? Or is there something more to it, and that's why there's so many people involved in it? You know, Does it work, or is it phony? Is there really a God? Or is it just kind of like a made-up scientific idea, like the scientists like to say, or, or sociologists, or somebody, you know, that we call experts on the field. And then they can't explain some of the questions you have. You know, like, uh, but what about, and then they don't have an answer either. Always ask. See, Jesus was opposite of what most pastors will tell you. Jesus said, ask, and you'd receive. Well, if you go to a church and ask too many questions, sometimes they'll tell you, you just don't want to know, you know, and they'll throw you out. Well, I was one of those people that asked and kept asking. And for 35 years, I've never stopped asking. As a matter of fact, I even ask people now that 
don't know so that they will know. <laughs> what did Jesus tell you? <laughs> you know, like, hey, dude, you know, try talking to him. Guess what? He does. You know, and that's where you need to come to that conclusion. Either God is real and you can address him and talk to him and figure it out, or this is all phony and you shouldn't be listening to this video. You know, you should be out there trying some other philosophy. You know, one of those like uh, motivational speakers, you know, to make you feel good, do good, and be good every day. I don't know about you, but there are days I woke up and you know what? No motivational speaker would have motivated me out of bed. <laughs> I didn't want to get up, so I didn't. But you see, when you're with God, you can't deny he exists. When you don't know God, oh sure, you could pretend that he doesn't, but even you know deep down inside somewhere, according to what the Bible says, you already know that God exists. The question is, is he really the way Jesus said or the way Christians say? That's for you to decide. You get to make that choice and the gospel is your first step along the way. Once you do that, I think you'll find that God will explain it a whole lot better sometimes than man can explain it. And that's why the gospel has to be personal to you. It has to be real to you. It has to be you and God alone. Because he's the only one that can save you.